And I remember after the photo shoot, I was in the limo going back to the training facility with Coach Dicka. And he looked at me and he says, I don't know how they got you to put on a wedding dress. <laughs> and again, I was like, you're supposed to tell me this before the photo shoot. <laughs> Ricky, What's Ricky up, Williams. How you doing, man? Can't complain. When you first start playing pool? Kind of a rite of passage is when you get that big paycheck, you get your own house. You gotta put a pool table in the house. Exactly. So when I got to New Orleans, I had a, I had a pool table in the house. Right, let's see what you can do. That was a solid break. Ricky, there was a lot of controversy. Your rookie year. <sighs> a lot was going on. I want to hear from your perspective. I've been dying to ask this question. Yeah. What was your rookie year like in New Orleans? No, there was an article at the end of my rookie year in ESPN the magazine, and it was titled "The Season from Hell," and that—that's—that was my year. It all started with, of all things, my choice of agent. I wanted to find someone that I could connect with, and uh, at the time, Master P, uh, uh, Miller, yes, yes, uh. yes. He uh, started No Limit Sports, mm -hmm. and uh, I became really close with with one of his runners. I just felt like family, you know, and and. No Limit was at was on top at that moment, and you know, I just dreaming about having a chain, you know, put, <laughs> put on my tank. You know? A little No Limit tank. Exactly. <laughs> so it started off with that. I got a lot of flack for signing signing with No Limit Sports. Took them with me to the combine. Oh, what a nightmare! I just, my my only half an hour doing the combine. I walk in the room and there's a room full of guys, and I'm in my underwear. First, they measure my hands, right? And they, they measure the width of your hands. One eighth, one fourth, got to get it down to the specific Ex inch. Exactly. And then, you know, after that, they realized I had the smallest hands in the draft. And then was a doozy, you know? They yell out your weight, okay? And so I was sitting on, I was standing on the scale. The guy says, two, four, two, point, eight. And you could hear a gasp, like a collective gasp in the room. Ugh. And then, of course, the next day, the article is about small hands, overweight, and, uh, Size Dr issues, exactly. undersized. Exactly, the, the journey, it started then. Another funny story. So, you know, before the draft, I went to visit the teams that were, you know, were looking at drafting me. And I went to New Orleans and we went to, uh, we went to lunch at a, at a famous Italian restaurant in New Orleans. And you know how at the end of a meal, they bring out the dessert tray mm -hmm. and they say, you know, pick what you want. So they brought out the dessert tray and I like desserts, you know? And, and in my mind, I was thinking, <laughs> A lot of these desserts look good, you know, but I just chose one. So I chose one and they came back around and said, do you want another dessert? And I was thinking, well, if they're asking me, you know, that means I'm supposed to say, yeah. Who right? am I to turn it down? Right? And so I said, yeah. Okay. And they came back again and said, are you, do you want another dessert? Three rounds of desserts? Three rounds of desserts. And I figured, you know, Mike Dick is here. The, you know, the vice president's here. They seem like they're okay. And so I said, sure, I'll have another, I'll have another dessert. <laughs> Not realizing that I came into the meeting with a, with a weight problem and they hear it <laughs> right in front of them, in front of that, no shame. You know, I had three, three desserts. And they still took you. And they still, and they still drafted me. But you know, the year, the year just kept on going and it, and it didn't get much better. So I finally make it into training camp. Mm -hmm. And when I got off the plane, there was a bunch of reporters and they had a magazine in their hand, you know? And earlier, earlier that summer, I did a photo shoot with Coach Jicka for ESPN the Magazine. And at the time, the writer for ESPN the Magazine, Dan Levitard, one of my best friends at the time, we were talking about, you know, how do we want to do this this photo shoot to, you know, to co to commemorate uh, the Saints drafting me, trading all the picks. And so he said, you know, it's kind of like a marriage. And so what if we did a picture of you in a wedding dress and Coach Jicka in a in a tuxedo? And at the time, I was in the car and I and I laughed and I said that that would be really funny and I didn't really think about it until I decided to do to do the photo shoot. And I remember after the photo shoot, I was in the limo going back to the training facility with Coach Dicka and he looked at me and he says, "I don't know how they got you to put on a wedding dress." <laughs> and again, I was like, "You're supposed to tell me this before the photo shoot." <laughs> to me, I just thought it was like Halloween wearing a costume, but it got blown out of proportion. And first day of training camp, I had to deal with this controversy. And it really set up a theme for my whole rookie season, and just all this controversy. Really my whole time in New Orleans, dealing with off the field controversy that detracted me from what I had to do on the field. As you look back on that, the scrutiny, the, the talk, how'd you handle all that? Another rookie mistake, not very well. <laughs> you know, I remember one day, training camp, it was raining, so I had my helmet on. 
go into a covered area to do an interview. I got to the, to the picnic bench and I sat down on the bench and as soon as I hit the bench, one of the media yelled, take off your helmet. And, I, and, and it hit me in that moment like, what if I don't want to, you know? And so I said, I, I smiled and I said, what if I don't want to? And then I just did the interview with my helmet on, just that one time. And as I was doing the interview, it, it felt empowering. You know, there, I was struggling with this relationship with the media where they feel they can just take, take, take. And I felt like I had nothing to myself. And I felt like that, that gesture of rebellion helped me stay sane and, and not feel like I was giving up too much. And so it became a kind of routine that throughout the whole season after practice, I'd always wear a helmet during my, during my interviews. And that became another thing that, that added to the Ricky Weirdo story and, and, and kind of separated me from, from my teammates. Good shot. Did you feel more pressure as a result of that? No, I'm, I'm asked that question a lot. And, and if I'm being honest, I didn't, I didn't feel the pressure. I, I think part of it is I put so much pressure on myself to be great. And a good example of that is my rookie contract, which was another part of the season. You know? <laughs> the way I looked at it, I thought, you know, I'll get a signing bonus, and this is my reward for what I did in college, but everything I do at this level, I should have to earn it. And so I told my, I told my agent, I want to make the minimum base salary and in order for me to make a lot of money, I need to have to perform. Looking back on that, do you regret that? I do, I do. <laughs> you know, and, there's, and I'll tell you why. There's a theme that runs through my whole rookie year. And there's a term in football, rookie mistakes. I made a lot of rookie mistakes. <laughs> you know, I was just young and naive and, and idealistic. You know, and the one thing that I didn't take into consideration is what if I get hurt? You know, and again, I, I hadn't had the experience up until that point of missing any game, so it didn't even cross my mind. Do you think you can be idealistic and play football? I think if you're an idealist, you're gonna be disappointed a lot, but if you do enough, you open doors so that your ideals can come to fruition later. And that's what I'm starting to see now. Things that I believed in, I'm starting to see them implemented more now into the NFL. And I like to think that, you know, my brief stint in the NFL contributed to things moving forward and things changing. I think the biggest one would be marijuana. Yeah. The conversation around marijuana. How you, as you look back on that, as disruptive as you were at the time, speaking out openly about it, how do you look about the current NFL situation and how marijuana is treated and looked at? It's crazy. I mean, it's the NFL, it's sports in general, but it's really our, our whole society. And, you know, I was shamed so much for this, you know, 15 years ago. And now I get calls from ESPN to come on television and talk about it, you know? And so, again, it's, it's things have moved and I, and I feel like I've done my part to be, to be a part of the change. And that feels good. Um, but it was rough, you know, and I think anyone, you know, who's been a trailblazer will have scars to, to, to prove it. So you got that? Uh, it's possible. Anything's possible. Okay, there it is. Thanks for kicking it with us. Subscribe to BR to check out more dope videos like this one.